While thinking about the NBA, you might envision some of the elites of the game. LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and a million other names come to mind. You might think about the incredible display of skill that they put on, like Jordan's famous mid-range shot to win Game 6 against the Jazz and secure a championship, or LeBron's mind-boggling chase-down block against the Golden State Warriors in the Finals. But what most fans don't think about is that the NBA does have a dark side, and they do try to hide it at all costs. The story of Latrell Sprewell is one such story that the NBA tries desperately to cover up and hide from the fans. Latrell Fontaine Sprewell was born on September 8, 1970. As a kid, he loved athletics and basketball and was a dominant player in his Washington High School basketball team. He was an extremely talented young player that many knew would one day make the NBA. Despite this, Sprewell decided to join the Three Rivers Community College Raiders basketball team, which as you can imagine was far from Division I basketball. After two successful years with his community college team, Sprewell went on to play for the University of Alabama from 1990 to 1992 where he played alongside future NBA players Robert Horry, Jason Caffrey, and James Robinson. Latrell had a promising career ahead of him, and after his two years in Alabama, he applied for the 1992 NBA Draft, where he was picked 24th overall by the Golden State Warriors. Immediately, Latrell became a big part of the Golden State team, averaging 15.4 points per game in his rookie season and starting 69 games. Fans and players around the league noticed his talent and Latrell got the nickname Spree. In his second season, Spree picked up even more steam, scoring 21 points per game while averaging 4.9 rebounds, 4.7 assists, and 2.2 steals per game, putting him among the league's leaders in points and steals per game. But there was a side to Spree that most fans didn't get to see. Spree had anger management issues and would often get into arguments or altercations with teammates in practice. In 1993, Spreewell got into a fight with his power forward teammate Byron Houston during practice. Now, usually fights between teammates isn't a huge cause for concern. You've probably heard of the legendary fight between Michael Jordan and Steve Kerr, where Jordan ended up giving Steve Kerr a black eye. Jordan and Kerr went on to have huge success in the playoffs, eventually winning championships together and developing great trust. But as we'll soon find out, things didn't turn out that way for Spree. Two years later, in 1995, Spree got into a fight during practice with Jerome Kersey, another one of his teammates. Despite being the one who started the fight, Spree was taking a beating from Kersey, and that is when the fight was broken up and Spree left. Everyone in the gym thought that Spree was going to leave and the two would calm down and then apologize to each other at the next practice, but Spree wasn't ready to let go just yet. Just a few moments after leaving, Spree came back with a 2x4 piece of lumber to hit Kersey with. His team eventually managed to grab the log and break up the fight, but Spree was enraged and promised that he would come back with a gun to shoot Kersey. Thankfully, things didn't go that far and after a few months, people began to forget about Spree's extreme anger. On the court, Spree only continued to improve, leading the Warriors in scoring for the next few years and making it onto the Western Conference All-Star team three times. In 1997, five years after being drafted, Spree was averaging over 24 points per game. Things were looking good for Spree, and with the help of his Rookie of the Year teammate Chris Webber, the Golden State Warriors looked like they could become title contenders in the very near future. Unfortunately, this is where things took a huge turn in the wrong direction. In December of 1997, though during another intense team practice in Oakland, Spree lost himself in rage once again when Warriors head coach PJ Carlesimo told Spree that he was being sloppy with his passes and needed to be more precise. Spree was not in the mood for criticism and threatened Carlesimo if he came close. Carlesimo didn't think Spree was being serious and came closer towards him. That's when Spree said one last time, don't come up on me, don't come up on me. Carlosimo ignored him again and when he kept walking towards Spree, Spree grabbed him by the throat. For the next 10 seconds, Spree choked and dragged Carlosimo backwards on the ground until the team separated the two. Spree then left practice but came back after 20 minutes and immediately punched coach Carlosimo in the face. Eventually, the assistant coaches and warrior players pulled Spree off and didn't let him come back. 
This was the first time that Spree's violent outbursts had been reported by major media, and people weren't happy. Despite Spree denying the incident, saying that he never punched Carlosimo and downplaying his actions, he was suspended by the NBA for 10 games without pay. The next day, however, pressure had mounted on the Warriors to punish Spree, and they decided to terminate Spreewell's contract, which included $23.7 million over three years. The NBA also extended their suspension from the original 10 days to a full year. Converse also canceled a sponsorship deal that they were about to make with Spree. In his one week, Spree went from being a promising young talent with a bright future in the NBA to a player that no team wanted and no fan base would accept. After his contract was terminated, Spree well went to arbitration and his contract was restored, but the NBA still suspended him for a year without pay. The whole incident was so big that even Michael Jordan commented on it, shaming Spree and saying that his punishment is well-deserved. I can't fathom the idea of choking a coach by no means no matter what he says, Jordan said. You gotta walk away. I have a conversation with a higher being, higher position person in that organization to voice my opinions about this coach, but the problem is that he, Spreewell, acted and he has to pay a penalty for that. Off the court, Spree only continued to spiral downward and make terrible decisions. Not long after being suspended, Spree was charged with reckless driving for going 90 miles per hour and causing an accident that injured two people. He took a plea deal and, as a result, only had to spend three months on house arrest. It looked like Spree would never play in the NBA again, but in 1999, the Golden State Warriors traded him to the New York Knicks where he played 37 games in his first season. At the time, the Knicks still had future Hall of Famer Patrick Ewing and were looking to make a playoff run after narrowly qualifying for the 1999 playoffs as the eighth seed in the East. Amazingly, the Knicks managed to beat the Miami Heat, Atlanta Hawks, and Indiana Pacers to make the NBA Finals, being the first eight-seed team in history in order to do that. Spree had an impressive showing, averaging 26 points per game during the Finals, but still the Knicks lost to the Spurs in five games. Spree had picked up media attention for his good play, being featured in Slam Magazine after Game 5 where he scored 35 points and grabbed 10 rebounds. Spree promised that he had changed and was a better man now, but the fans and media weren't convinced. The next season, Spreewell started as a small forward and did decently well, scoring 18.6 points per game. That year, led by Patrick Ewing and Allen Houston, Spree's Knicks went 50-32 in the regular seed, securing the third seed in the East. They narrowly beat the Toronto Raptors and Miami Heat in the playoffs, once again making the Eastern Conference Finals, where they lost to the Indiana Pacers. The Knicks thought Spree was a big part of their team's success and extended his contract for five more years and $62 million. The next year, Patrick Ewing was traded to Seattle, and despite an impressive season for Spree that would get him a play in the All-Star game, the Knicks would lose in the first round of the playoffs to the Toronto Raptors in a close five-game series. In the 2001-2002 season, Spreewell averaged 19.4 points per game and had a 49-point game against the Boston Celtics, but ultimately, the season didn't play out in the Knicks' favor and they missed the playoffs for the first time in 15 years. In the offseason that followed, the New York Post reported that Spreewell had broken his hand during a fight on his yacht. Spreewell denied the claims and sued the New York Post, but he lost his case and was fined $250,000 for failing to report the injury. That year, Spree again had scoring success and even set a record for most consecutive three-pointers made in a single game, scoring nine in a row. From 2003 to 2005, Spree played for the Minnesota Timberwolves, where the team lost in the finals to the Los Angeles Lakers in his first year there. After that title run, though, Spree's performance dropped considerably, and teams weren't willing to pay Spree the high salaries he had been offered in the past. In 2005, Spreewell got offers from both the Dallas Mavericks and the San Antonio Spurs, two teams that were thought of as title favorites, but he refused to respond to both offers and retired. Even after retirement, though, Spree couldn't keep out of trouble and had many run-ins with the law. In 2006, Spree was accused of strangling a woman on his yacht while having sex with her. Ultimately, the police decided not to pursue the case. In 2007, Spree's longtime girlfriend sued him for $200 million, 
claiming that Spreewell promised to support her and her kids. Just a few months later, Spreewell had his yacht repossessed by the federal government because he had failed to keep up with its payments. Spreewell lost one of his homes in Milwaukee in that same year, and in 2009, his New York mansion went into foreclosure status, but was released shortly after. In 2011, Spreewell had a reported debt of $3.5 million to the state of Wisconsin. To this day, Spree still has had small altercations with law enforcement and was arrested in 2013 for disorderly conduct. And that is the true story of what happened to Latrell Spreewell. As always, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe and turn on notifications. Our fans mean a lot to us and you are the reason why we keep making these videos. So thank you and make sure to check out some of our other videos as well as the many new videos that we release each week.